Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Trade Station Masterclass. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedules and be here uh, with us today. We're going to do an easy language class in just a moment. But uh, before we get to the content of today's presentation, let's go through, through some of the introductions and some of the disclosures of the class. All right, the title of today's presentation is Create Simple Custom Charting Indicators with Easy Language. So we're going to take a look at some of the functionality in TradeStation that allows you to create custom studies and put your trading ideas into something that TradeStation can understand and be able to plot on a chart, whether it is a, an indicator line or a, um, a strategy that you can backtest. For those that are new to the TradeStation Masterclass, my name is Jesus Nava. I'm the Director of Client Training and Education for TradeStation Securities. Always a pleasure to be here talking about the TradeStation technology. So let's go to some of our disclosures. Just keep in mind that every symbol and idea that we talk about is for educational purposes only. These are not recommendations of TradeStation. Also that active trading is not suitable for everyone and that past historical performance is no guarantee of future results. For additional information on these disclosures, go to www.tradestation.com forward slash important dash information. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, start this presentation. As I said at the very beginning, this is a programming class uh, for many of you. If you're just getting started with TradeStation, um, it may be a little bit challenging. I always say that learning a little bit of easy language can take your trade station analysis and trading to that next level because you're able to modify not only what's supplied with trade station and make modifications to those indicators and strategies that are built into the platform, but you can also create your own. So you bring on your own trading ideas, or maybe you learn a new methodology from uh, a pro trader and you want to implement that methodology on TradeStation, all those things can be you know, translated into a language that TradeStation can understand. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is easy language elements. So what's, what's required, what's needed for you to get started um, in this journey if you want to write your easy language. First of all, uh, we want to point out that easy language elements are color coded to assist you in identifying the type of element and making sure the spelling is correct. Easy language uses what's called syntax coloring. So as you're typing in your easy language code, you're gonna see certain words turn a particular color. You're gonna see blue words that are called reserved words. These are words that TradeStation knows what the meaning is. If you type in if you type these words into the code, TradeStation knows exactly what that word means. I'll give you an example. If you type in the word close, C-L-O-S-E, uh, Easy Language recognizes that that's the closing price of the bar. If you type in the word uh, time, Easy Language recognizes it, and it's going to look at the time on the candlestick and, and see what that time is. So these are words that are already in the language, and they'll turn up blue just to let you know, oh, I know what this word means. For other words that the easy language environment does not recognize, they're just gonna be plain black or whatever the default color of the you know plain text is. Uh, these colors can be changed, by the way. You're also gonna find some purple words uh, that easy language calls them functions. These have a very particular purpose and um, application inside of the easy language code. These are pre-programmed functions and mathematical formulas that you can call from within the language. So think of functions as a snippet of easy language programming that is already created for you that's going to simplify a lot of the calculations and you can bring them in into your code. An example, the word average. If you type in the word average inside of your code, it'll turn in purple because it'll, it, it's, it's a mathematical calculation. As soon as you type in the word average, easy language knows what, what to do, and it's just gonna average the values that you supply within that function. So two things that I wanted to point out, reserved words and functions. And today, we're gonna write our own custom indicator. You're gonna see how some of these components uh, come into play. We do require the proper use of, uh, proper use of punctuation 
Um, easy language is very picky about uh, the punctuation that you use. Uh, the most misused punctuation is the semicolon. This is one of those things that you always forget, you know? Uh, when you're writing English, let's say, and you finish the sentence or a paragraph, you know that you have to end that with a period. Well, easy language is expecting for you to tell when the statement or the sentence is complete. And easy language is gonna use a semicolon to identify that. This is the end of the statement. I'm gonna go on to a separate idea. If you don't use a semicolon to separate statements, easy language is gonna to try to jumble them together and it's not gonna make sense to the easy language programming. We all, all, we're all we also gonna use parentheses um, a lot of times to separate um, parameters within a function. For example, we did talk about average. Average needs two parameters. It needs the value that's been averaged and also the number of periods that are gonna be used in that calculation. Those two parameters, you know, the value that's been averaged and the number of periods are separated by commas. Um, I was thinking of commas and I was, uh, you know, I started saying parentheses. Uh, what I'm explaining about the parameters within parentheses, yes, they're separated by commas, but um, Whenever you use a function, you'll need parentheses to supply the parameters. And we also use parentheses to control the order of operations in a mathematical formula. If you want things to be calculated first, we use these parentheses to control that math. Here's the comma, separating items within parentheses, like the parameters within a function. We have the quotations. This is just a label or text. And we have the square brackets that are used to reference historical data. I don't believe we're gonna use square brackets today. We're not gonna use, uh, we probably use quotation marks to create some labels, but some of these punctuations are important when you start writing easy language because um, it'll give your code a little bit of structured and Trade Station will know exactly what to do. All right, let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, the structure, easy language structure, we follow a a certain structure that um, we recommend that you follow as well. Every built-in study and strategy that is supplied with a trade station platform uses this structure. First, it's gonna provide inputs. Inputs, if you've been with trade station some time, you know that these are uh, ways for um, the trade station user to have access to certain parameters and, and, and have the ability to modify those parameters in the front end. When I say the front end, I'm talking you know, about the trade station desktop. So you don't have to go to the easy language editor and change the programming code in the editor to change the parameters. You can use inputs to do that. And as you write your own custom studies, you're gonna see that inputs are gonna give you this ability to modify these parameters on the fly. After, identifying what inputs you're gonna be using, then you have some variables. Variables are calculated values and variables are gonna act as little containers that contain a particular value. For example, this variable that's right here in this example, AVG, this is a made up word. Uh, a lot of times when you have the word inputs and the, the word variables and then you have a colon right after it, it's because you are going to start you're gonna start defining what these inputs and variables are gonna be. And these are going to be user created variables and inputs that have a descriptive name. So AVG, notice that it's in black. It doesn't mean anything to, to easy language unless you go in there and tell it what AVG is. So the next thing that you would do is assign a calculation to that variable. So AVG equals the average of the close for the average length. Notice the use of the function. Notice that it's also in purple, so recognized by easy language as a function. Notice the parentheses and notice the two parameters that are inside of the average function. Average needs those two parameters in order to calculate. And then once it runs the calculation, all you need to do is plot whatever value is it the one you're calculated. And this is the way that you um, create that structure. You have the parentheses, Inside the parentheses, you provide the value that you want to plot on the chart. And the quotation AVG is just a label that is optional. You can place it there or not. It'll still work. 
we do recommend you have a descriptive label for every plot. It'll make things easier when you format the indicator. So that's it. Uh, let me go back here. That's the structure that every indicator in TradeStation follows. Of course, it's not going to look as simple as it does right here on this PowerPoint slide, but um, as you get more familiar with easy language and as you open up indicators and strategies within TradeStation, you're going to see that we follow this same structure in the code. By the way, this information that I have on this PowerPoint slide, we also have it available as a PDF. Manolo is going to share that PDF right here in the chat in case you're new with, uh, with easy language and need a reference guide. When you type in inputs, input parameters are user set values passed into a function or calculation. Uh, we talked about this. Input parameters, you're going to create them. That's why it says user set values. Um, they may also be used in your code to dynamically change the calculation or functionality of your study. This is very simple. You know, if you have a moving average on a chart and you want to modify the parameters, you go and edit the moving average and you go to the inputs tab and change the parameters there. Well, in easy language, when you are creating your own custom study, you do have to supply these inputs and have that flexibility within your code. Inputs are given the descriptive names when declared and inputs must be declared and given an initial value. Or we did see an example of an input. In this case, at the bottom of this PowerPoint slide, you see an input. Uh, the input name is AVGLEN, average length. And in parentheses, it starts as a starts at a default value, in this case, 20. By the way, the, the word input and inputs can be used interchangeably. Uh, they both mean the same thing, the singular form or the plural form, and you can use them inside of your code exactly in the same way. And variables, a little bit about the variables. They're used to store information that is referenced and manipulated in a study. We're gonna take a look at that more in a practical way. They're given a descriptive name. They increase readability, uh, reduce typographical errors and improve processing efficiency. Those are some of the benefits of using variables inside your code. And variables must be declared and given an initial value. Here's an example, variable colon AVG. And this is interesting because as you, um, as you assign a calculation or a mathematical formula to these variables, it's going to be, it's going to be very easy for you to reference that same calculation by just using the name of your variable. It makes it very simple. Um, as it says right here, it increases readability. And of course, you're going to reduce typographical errors if you have to continuously type a formula it's so much better just to you know store that formula into a variable and then use the variable instead a few steps to building studies and this is just for reference and you may do these you know in different order but the first thing you need to do is open the easy language development environment you're going to select the study type one of the things that you have to pay attention to is the type of the type of easy language document you're creating. If your idea is to have an indicator similar to indicators like RSI or DMI that appear at the bottom of a chart, then you need an indicator. But if you're looking to create a strategy to backtest that generates entries and exits, then the type of easy language document you need is a strategy. If you start off, let's say for example, a strategy, and you use a word like plot inside of that strategy document, it's just gonna generate an error. So be very aware of the type of study that you are selecting. Give your new indicator a unique descriptive name. We recommend using a prefix. A prefix is gonna help you group your custom studies together. That way, um, when you go to the list of studies, instead of having everything scattered, because it sorts in alphabetical order. By using a prefix, all your studies with that same prefix will be grouped together. We write your easy language code. We verify the indicator. The verification is a process uh, by which TradeStation uh, checks to see if there's any errors and it'll tell you if it's not able to verify. 
So you have to fix any errors if it finds any errors. And if you made edits, you have to verify again. Verification is like a compiling or a compiler that creates a study and makes it available on the TradeStation platform. So make sure that you always verify, otherwise you won't be able to apply the study or the strategy. Once you have the study created, we go to properties. And properties are important because properties will define where the study is going to be drawn, if it's gonna be on top of the candles or at the bottom of the chart. You're also gonna have the ability to define the colors, the style, and if you want dotted lines or solid lines, if you want transparencies, Anything related to the indicator is inside of the properties and you have to go in there um, after the indicator is compiled or verified. And once you make changes to the properties and the style and anything you want the indicator to, to reflect, then you have to verify one more time. So yes, properties, ha they, properties have to be edited or, or changed within two verification processes. You verify first to make sure the code um, there's no errors in the code. And then you go into properties and then verify one more time. And last, you have to apply the indicator to the chart and make sure that you validate the visual. A lot of times, you know, that's uh, that's when you realize uh, if your indicator is working properly or not. You know, you are looking for validation on the chart, uh, meaning that this is exactly what you were looking for. And this is these are the values that I, I wanted on my screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it here on our trade station, I'm going to do a very simple indicator so you can see how quickly you can create indicators on, on trade station. And then we'll go into something a little bit more advanced uh, with a little bit more uh, variety in the components that are used inside the code. And this way I can show you, you know, how to access the dictionary and how to access other help resources when it comes to creating your own studies and strategies. I'm going to switch over to my trade station platform and I'm going to open up a chart. When you open up a chart, TradeStation automatically loads data, which is massive. You know, when you access data in TradeStation, we have a massive historical database and you can tap into that database as you wish. You know, by default on a five minute time frame, TradeStation only gives me uh, five days of data. But if I wanted to have a year, five years, 10 years of five minute data, all that data is there. And what I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is that that data is accessible to easy language and you can manage and use that data to perform your own calculations. So as soon as you put the chart into TradeStation, we have information such as the opening price, the high and the low of every single candlestick, the closing price of every single candlestick, the time, you have access to volume, you have access to up volume, down volume, you have access to open interest, if you're looking at, you know, something that has open interest, like uh, an optionable symbol or, um, you know, a futures contract. Let's do something simple. I'm gonna switch over here to my development environment for now. So let's go here to easy language. So go to apps, easy language. This is the way that you access the development environment. And when I was talking about selecting the type of indicator that you want to use and be careful about that, and I'm going to go to the file menu and go to the new section. And notice that we have all these types of studies that you can create. I'm going to create an indicator. And this is just going to be an example um, so that, you know, you know how quickly and how easy it is to create a study. I'm going to call this exclamation MC. Usually I use the exclamation MC, uh, MC for master class. And I use the at symbol for the same reason that we talked about earlier, just to have my custom studies, you know, um, grouped together. I'm just gonna use open. I'm gonna click on okay. And notice that very quickly, I can just create a plot statement. By the way, plot uh, and the number is a reserved word. You can see that it turns up blue. Uh, you're gonna see that as soon as you start typing words, uh, they'll come up in, in a particular color. If I make a separation between the word plot and the number one, notice that the word plot, it's still blue, but the number one is not separated. And it doesn't, I mean, easy language doesn't do anything with just the number one and is not recognized. So let's go ahead and if I added to my plot statement, notice that everything is blue. And what it does is just gonna find, whatever you're plotting is gonna find that, that data point on your chart and it's going to draw right at that point 
And what I'm going to do here for plot number one, I'm going to open up the parentheses and I'm going to type in the word close. Again, if I go here and separate the word C with the remaining letters, notice what happens. C is recognized as the closing price, but the word lose is not recognized by easy language. And some of the punctuation that we talked about, every statement in easy language ends with a semicolon. So that's what I do here. And we just finished our first indicator. Very quickly, I'm able to just grab a data point on my chart and plot it. This is the close and I'm just gonna plot it. Let's verify this. I'm gonna click on the verification checkbox up here. That's how you verify. There's a checkbox. On the under the file menu, you have the verify option as well, or the verify all. You can also use the F3 function key on your keyboard in order to verify. Now I'm gonna put this indicator on the chart without having changed any of the properties. And you're gonna see what it looks like. If you don't change any of the properties, you know, trade station will just use default values. Let me go over here to my trade station, go to studies, add study, and I'm gonna go here, scroll up. I did say that these um, special characters are sorted at the top. And um, I think I call this MC just open. Here it is, MC open. I'm just gonna click okay and okay. And that's how the indicator looks right there at the bottom of the screen. Notice how quickly we were able to tell easy language. I want you to just plot the close. And this red line that is right here at the bottom at 57.87 is exactly the closing price of every single bar historically is able to access the database and plot it. It's plotting on a separate subgraph, which is okay. That's the default way that the indicator works, but you can change it. Notice how the default color is red. The default style is a solid line. So those are things that you can change in properties. Uh, so let me go ahead and remove it and show you some of the things that we can do. I'm gonna go here, right click on the code and go to properties. In here, the chart style, let's say that we wanna make that line thicker. This is for plot number one. Let's say for example, that I wanna make that line um, blue. And for the scaling, I don't want it to be on its own axis. I wanna be on the same axis as the underlying data, meaning that I want it on top of the candles. So these are three things that I changed. I changed the color, I changed um, the thickness, and I also changed where the indicator was going to plot. I'm gonna click okay. So the next thing that I do is verify. Again, if you don't verify, those properties are not going to stick. So I'm gonna right click and go to verify. Verifies again. I'm gonna go back to trade station, then go here to studies, at study, and then this is at MC open. It should go right into the chart. And now you can see, if I open up my chart, that there is a blue line connecting every closing price of every candle. All right, so you can see how easy it is for you to just grab any data point and then make calculations based on those data points. And you have access to, again, open, high, low, close, volume, um, everything that you would expect inside of a candle, including volume. Let's go ahead and take a look at an indicator. And it's an indicator that I also make available here in class for you to practice. And Manolo, if you can share that zip folder with everyone here, it's an indicator that plots the opening range. Um, it has flexibility because you can determine what. how do I define the opening range? Is it the high? and the low of the very first bar? Or is it the high and the low of the very first hour of the day? So this is this is an indicator that's gonna give you that flexibility of plotting you know, those lines across the chart, whatever that opening range is, all right? So let's go ahead and create an indicator. That, that study that Manolo just shared is the easy language uh, code of that study. But I'm just gonna walk you through how to set it up so that we can understand all the components. And then once you open it, it'll make a little bit more sense as uh, you're able to identify all those pieces in the code. So let me go and uh, first of all, go over to my development environment. And um, this is the code, by the way, if you open it, if you open it up inside of your trade station, let's go ahead and open up an indicator. 
And we're going to call this at MC open range, but um, I'm going to call it class so that I know that this is the indicator that I worked during class. And then we're going to, you know, take it step by step. Uh, some of the things that are also noticeable here is where this study is going to be available. You know, this is not a radar screen study, so I'm just going to uncheck it. Sometimes, you know, if you uncheck things on this particular section, uh, this is more like for cleanup of your studies. If you're creating a study that is specially or exclusively designed for charting, there is no point in having that study up here in radar screen. Why would I want that indicator there cluttering my list of studies if, not, if I'm not going to be using it on radar screen? So this is the reason why sometimes I uncheck an application if I don't want the study to show up on a particular app. If you're creating an indicator that works on both, then it's fine. Then you, you don't even have to worry about checking or unchecking things. And also one thing that I've done here is setting my template to none. We have some templates here that get you started on easy language. It gives you some, uh, like a template for you to, to start making your code, but um, I select none so that it opens up a, an empty you know, document. Okay, so we are creating an indicator that's gonna look at the highest high and the lowest low of a particular period at the beginning of the day. I'm gonna set that to the very first hour of the trading day. And I'm talking about stocks just as an example, but this also works on, on futures if you're a futures trader. So it's gonna look at the very first hour of trading activity and determine what the highest high and the lowest low are. And then it's gonna plot those lines across the chart. And I'm gonna use that opening range as a way to maybe um, analyze the market going forward. Maybe you can use it as a use this as a strategy later on and we can work on this same idea once we talk about strategies. The same way that we have a class on creating studies, we also have a class on creating strategies. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to set up an inputs, my inputs. Notice that I start with the word inputs um, always look for the word to turn blue. If, you, if it doesn't turn blue, either you mistyped it, something's wrong. But notice that as soon as I type in the word inputs, it comes up in blue. And I'm going to use an input that's called end time. The reason why I want to supply an end time is because um, it gives you flexibility in terms of, okay, um, how long do I want to look at at the beginning of the day to set this opening range? I'm going to set this to 1030 just by default. I did say that I wanted to look at the very first hour of trading activity. Uh, times in easy language are expressed in this format. 1030 is 1030, and you have to put it in there at the, uh, in, the in that exact same format. If I put in, you know, um, if I want this to be 4 p.m., then it would be 1600, all right? So just keep that in mind. When it comes to time, we have to use a straight number and just put it in there um, if we want to reference a specific time. This word right here, end time, doesn't mean anything to easy language. It does now because I'm declaring it as an input. So now every time that I use the word end time, it knows that it's 1030. Okay, let's go ahead and type in my variables. These are my calculated values. And I'm going to call this open, I mean, uh, range high and range low. Try to uh, specify words that are not recognized by easy language because inputs and variables are supposed to be user defined. These are words that um, make sense to you and words that you want to use in your own code. Um, so if you type in something and it turns blue or magenta, try to change it up a little bit so it's different. And that way it won't create any conflicts. Range high is going to look at the highest high within that you know, range. And the range low is going to look at the lowest low on that range. The reason why we have this parentheses and zero is because you have to tell easy language the type of variable they are. In this case, they are what's called numeric variable, meaning that they hold a number. Uh, we have text variables. We have true, false variables. So um, that's something that you're going to learn with practice. But you do have to tell easy language the type of variables that you're using and the reason why we use the parenthesis zero, it's because they both are numeric. Now, we're going to define range high 
to be equal to the high. And the range low is going to be equal to the low. But one thing that I need to do, notice that every single line here in my code ends with a semicolon, and that way it'll be it'll you know be separation between my lines of code. So at the very beginning of the day, when the market opens, you're going to set range high to the high of the bar and range low to the low of the bar. But you need a way to, first of all, find what the first bar of the day is. That's the first thing you need to do. And there is a function inside of easy language that does that very nicely. Because if you find the very first bar of the day, then you can reset the range high and the range low to the high and the low of that day. Does that make sense? So let me go ahead and go um, right here above these two assignments. And I'm going to say, if the time, notice that I used the word time by itself. Remember that we talked about data that is available on the candlesticks. And we said that time was one of those data elements. Easy language is able to look at the candlestick and see what the time is. So when I say here, if the time equals, it's going to look at the time of the bar and make sure that it matches whatever I'm going to supply here. And that you know, um, function that I'm going to use here is called session first bar time. Make sure that you spell it correctly. Notice that it turns magenta, meaning that it knows what it is and it's going to look for something uh, because it's programmed to do so. If you want to look for things that are time related, I recommend you come here to the, um, not the properties, these are properties. Let me go ahead and uh, over here on the right, there's a dictionary tab that allows me to search for things. And if I search for time, you're going to get all the different words that are used um, in easy language that reference time. At the top, it's going to be a lot of object-oriented easy language. But if I scroll down, you're going to find or start seeing things as uh, reserved for words and user functions are these ones that have a purple color to them. So notice that there's our session first bar time, which is the word that we're using today. Notice that if I highlight it, it gives me what the function is doing and how I need to set it up. Uh, we don't have a an example here on how to use it, but we can, you know, there's a lot of resources and a lot of documentation on every function of TradeStation. If you want to see all the functions that are available in TradeStation, instead of searching, let me go back here. Okay, so this is the, the original, how the original menu looks like. Just open up Easy Language, the Easy Language category, and at the very bottom, you have user functions. So these are all the hundreds and hundreds of user functions that are pre-programmed in Easy Language. And again, if you click on any of these, you get um, documentation on that function and what it does. So I'm going to say, if the time equals the session first bar time, by the way, the function is going to find, it, the function already knows what the time of the first bar of the day is. And this needs a one, and, uh, and it's a one. The reason why we're using the one and one is because it has to reference uh, the session type and also the session number. Let me right click here on this function and go to um, the definition. The first one is going to be either uh, the regular session or auto detect. It's either a zero or a one. So the one that we're supplying here in this session first bar time function is because it's just using the regular session. And this applies to stocks and also for futures. And you know that time is going to change. You know, the beginning or the, on, on a stock, for example, if you have a five minute chart like we do here, let me switch over to my trade station uh, platform. This is a five minute chart on Oxy, O-X-Y. We know that the time on the very first bar is going to be 9.35. It's not 9.30. 9.30 is when the bar opens. The time on the bar is when the bar closes. So on a five-minute bar, the time on the first bar is going to be 9.35. On a 20-minute bar, the time on the very first bar is going to be 9.50. If you bring up a 30-minute chart, the time on the very first bar is going to be 10. 
This variation is what the function does. It knows exactly what the time on the first bar is based on the session or the time frame that you have on the chart. Hopefully that makes sense because it's gonna it's gonna be it's a function that's useful whenever you want to identify that very first bar of the day. And that's why the function's called session first bar time. So if it finds this candlestick that matches the time of that very first bar, then begin. I want to set these two values. All right. Sometimes we use tabbing here just so that it gives us a little bit more of a visual when, you know, statements are a condition of each other. So that as soon as it finds the first bar, it's going to set the high and the low to that high and low of that bar. But then now we need a way of replacing it if the next bar has a higher high or a lower low, because that's good for the very first bar. You know, the very first bar is on the chart and then you're telling it, yes, yeah, set it to the high and the low. What if we want to extend our open range to the very first hour of the day? This is when the time that we specify up here comes into play. And we're going to say, if the time is less than or equal to end time, notice that we don't type in 1030. We use the word end time. And this is going to give us flexibility to change that time if we need to. Then begin. So only do this if you're within the time range. That's exactly what we're doing here. If the time is less than our end time, then begin. And I'm going to say if the high of any bar after that first bar is greater than range high, then range high equals high. That makes sense, right? So once you've identified the high and the low of that very first bar, if you find a high that is greater than the high that identified on the first bar, then replace it. Make the range high that high. And then we do the other one. If the low is less than the range low, then range low equals the low. And then we have to end our block here. Whenever you use a begin, uh, make sure that you have an end. And begin and end is a you know syntax structure that allows you to do multiple things within an if then. Uh, you know, if we're within the time, if it's less than 1030, we want to do two things. We want to you know keep an eye on the high and keep an eye on the low. And it's going to replace them if needed. And now it's just a matter of plotting those lines. Plot one, range high, and plot two, range low. The reason why we use labels, and this is something that I want to talk to you about. When I go over here to the chart, and if you guys remember the study that we created, let me put it right here on the chart one more time. Uh, I think it was called the open. When you go to the uh, style, for example, notice that the plot just says plot one. It doesn't have a name here. When you have studies that have multiple plots, it will just say plot one, plot two, plot three. So they're hard to identify and know which one's which. That's why sometimes a label is recommended. So if I go here to my code, I can provide a label within these parentheses and say, um, this is range, range high. Notice that I'm putting it under or inside quotations and um, easy language is painting it in red, letting me know that that's a label, it's text. So now when I verify, let me verify this code. And when I go to properties and I go to chart style, notice that instead of having the plot number, I have the exact name of the plot that I want to change. So this is, just makes it easier for you to know which plot is it the one you are modifying. A couple of things that I want to do here. First of all, if you're setting, you know, a, a range, an open range, high and low, you want those lines to be on top of the candles because you want those lines to extend 
going forward and give you a visual of with this where this open high low range is. So I'm going to go here to the scaling and I'm going to set the scale to same axis as underlying data. So always think about the indicator you're creating, whether it needs to be at the bottom of the chart or does it need to be on top of the candles? This is a, a type of study that goes right on top of, of the candles. I'm going to go to the style. All right, we have these set as lines. Um, let's do a thicker line on both. And the color, I have the high, you know, let's set them both to yellow. All right, the high and the low. I'm going to do the, let's do the high a different color just to differentiate. I'm going to do this cyan. So cyan and yellow. I'm just going to click OK and verify one more time. Let me go back to my chart. Go to studies, add studies. This is called at MC open range. We did it in class and click OK. All right. This is the opening of the day. Let me go ahead and draw a vertical line right here. So this is the opening of the day. From that moment on, it's gonna keep track of the highest high and the lowest low. Notice that the lowest low happened on the very first bar of the day. And what happens here? We have a straight horizontal line going across the chart. If we look at you know what happened on the highs, every single candlestick after the opening made a new high. And it was, hmm, this is not giving me, well, yes, this is 10, this is still within the first hour. It's just that, you know, the day is just starting. If you look at the time on any of these bars, this is 10, 15. It's not until this bar, the 10, 30 bar, where the indicator stops calculating. So on, on these other candles where the high is clearly above that horizontal line, it's not updated. So we can see those lines clearly on the screen. There's a little thing here that I don't like on my studies, this diagonal that's created from one day to the next. And that happens, you know, every single time the indicator resets, then you have these weird uh, diagonal lines because it's just one line that extends, you know, from one candlestick to the next. Sometimes what I do is I go here to the settings of the study. You can do this in properties too. And instead of using a line, I use something as a, maybe a cross for both. I can set that as a default. This will send the, the, the settings over to my easy language. So this is a nice way of you um, having the platform and the easy language development environment communicate with each other. I'm setting the default here in on the platform, and this is going to send these settings to the properties of my indicator. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to click OK. So now, instead of having those diagonals from one day to the next, um, they're gone. Now I can see just the lines, you know, plotted as crosses. I can choose dots if I wanted to. If you like the lines, you can leave the lines. But this is, you know, uh, giving me the open range for the very first hour of the day. And if I double click on this indicator, I have the ability to go to the inputs and change the time here. So if you want to change this to noon, for example, let me set this to uh, 1200 and click OK. Then the calculation happens until noon. Yeah, this is 1215. You can see that the, in, uh, the calculation was shifted. Even in today's trading activity, you know, we were seeing these candles that had penetrated the upper line now are recalculated and the high of that range has been updated. Remember that we set the settings by default on the platform. It says here the file has been modified outside of this editor window. Do you want to reload it? I'm going to say yes. That's what you know kicks in the, the parameters that I changed on the front end. All right, guys, I'm going to end the class here. I want to appreciate the time that you spent with me today. If you have any questions about any of the elements of this class, please email education at tradestation.com. And also uh, check out our events calendar. We have great sessions coming up. Make sure that you keep an eye on them and register for any of the ones that you're interested in. 
Have a wonderful day and thank you for joining me today. Goodbye, everyone.